we are divided. This overwhelming amount of sexism that has been on display this year. We have to stop demonizing people and realize the biggest terror threat in this country is white men. I give everything I can to my children. If I had to go without, it's okay, as long as my children. Privilege still dictates who gets job interviews, who gets hired, and who gets promoted. When society tells you that you are worth less than somebody else, it's easy to start believing that. How did it get this bad? I just want to welcome all of our campuses, those of you who are watching online, all of our guests, welcome to Northridge Church. And this morning we're, we're diving into what I believe is, is one, of a, one of those pinnacle series in the life of our church called Fractured. And it doesn't take much time to turn on your television, to read social media, to grab a newspaper or log on to an app to realize that in our community and in our country, we're divided. I mean, it's right there. The reality is, is you can't miss it. It's all over the pages of the news stations. It's all over the pages of your laptop and the newspaper that we live in a divided country, community. We have divided relationships. And, and really, the question that many people ask is, you know, as a Christ follower, how do I navigate how do I walk in life in a tense and tumultuous country, in a tense and tumultuous community? Like, how do we live in this, this, this area that is so divided? How do I live in relationships that are so divided and so tense? And ultimately, that's what we want to answer throughout this series is how we as Christians walk through a divided area. And it's interesting that God has kind of teed this conversation up for us. This series was really planned a year ago. We prayed over it. We believed God had big things in store for it. But God really teed up the conversation through some local events in the last couple weeks that have really stirred in people's minds and hearts. How do I deal with this? And I want to start really this series by building a foundation. One, I want you to understand that these next four weeks aren't the solution to every fracture in our country and our community. But I do believe it is a great step for our church. It's a great step where we start to engage some conversations that just need to be had. And so I, I kind of want to give you a glimpse over the next four weeks of where we're actually going to be going in this series. I want to let you know, I want to show you my card so you understand where we are headed in this series. This morning we're going to start with the root of division where division actually comes from, and then over the next three weeks, we're going to jump into some really difficult conversations where we see the symptoms of the root issue. We're going to talk about sexism, we're going to talk about racism, and we're going to talk about classism or favoritism. And so that's where we're headed in, in this series, and I, I, I am honestly excited. You know, this is, this is, I'll be honest, it's not the most exciting topic to preach. It's not going to be the most fun there's going to be some, some tense moments, some difficult conversations, but I believe God has big plans for our church. I believe God is going to use this series not to stretch in the divide, but to bring us together that we could actually, as a church, become a difference maker in our community and bring and heal some of those wounds that have been there for a very long time. And that is my prayer for this series. And so we're going to start this morning with the root issue. You see, if we don't win the battle with the root issue, we'll never, ever get to the symptoms of the issue. And so James really tees up the question for us in chapter 4, in, in verse 1. He says this, he asks the question, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And so James just really tosses out the question that we're all asking and wondering right now in, in our lives. Like, hey, what is causing all the division? Well, why is it so tense in our community and on social media and on the news? Like, why are we fighting and why are there quarrels all around us? And what's interesting is James is actually the brother of Jesus, and he's writing to a church audience. 
He's not writing to the culture around him. He's writing to the church. And the one thing that I think we fail to realize when we think of all the divisions is they're not just out in the community. They're actually in the church, too. They're in our relationships. And and so James asks the question. He tees it up for us. He says, hey, what's, what's the deal? What's the root issue here? And he actually quickly answers it. He says this, don't they come from the desires that battle within you? Don't they come from this war that is not raging on on the outside, but this war that is actually waging within me? And James kind of builds a foundation. He says, the thing we have to understand about division is division begins within. Division starts not out in the community, not in our country, but division actually starts in my heart and in your heart. That's where the root of all division begins, on the inside. And and here's the scary part about that. Here's the scary part about understanding that is the beginning or the origin of division is invisible. We can't see it. The fact that it, it lands right here in my heart, I get to see the symptoms of the root issue, but I don't really see the root issue with my own eyes. It's invisible. You think much like cancer today. Cancer is is rampant in our culture, and our community, and the thing that's scary about cancer is I've known many people, my wife worked in, in a cancer hospital for about eight years, and she saw numerous stories of people who walked around with cancer in their bodies and never even knew it. And I believe we do the same thing with division. We walk around with division in our hearts, and we have no clue it's there. We have no clue it exists. Because we can't see it. We see the symptoms of it. We see racism. We see sexism. We see classism. But we don't understand that where all that stems from starts right here. And we can't see it. And James kind of tees up the conversation. But Paul begins to unfold the the greatest divide that we all face. The the root divide that we all encounter and all deal with. And he does it in Galatians chapter 5. He says this, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us the, the, the desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two are, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. And so here Paul does is he expounds on the question that James asks. What's causing the fights and quarrels among us? Well, here Paul says, here, here it is. The divide is between your sinful nature and the spirit of God living in you. Paul is speaking to believers, to to disciples of Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, you have to understand the root cause of every division that you see in America, that you see in your community, that you see in your relationships starts with this divide in your heart between your sinful nature and the spirit of God. That's a major battle that we have to learn to win. And so let's define some of the terms. The sinful nature. What is a sinful nature? Well, every single one of us has it. We're born with it. Every human being is is born. The sinful nature is the the part of your, your life that is alienated towards God rebellious towards God. It's, it's that, that tendency that we all have. It's natural. It's a natural tendency to do what is wrong, to chase after what is evil. That is our sinful nature. It stems all the way back from the beginning of the creation of the world. Adam and Eve, their disobedience leads all of us to be born with this sinful nature. And what happens is it is constantly fighting in believers' hearts with the Spirit of God. You see, when you say yes to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you, and that Spirit wages war against your sinful nature, against that part that is rebellious to God. And in here, here Paul says these two forces are, are waging war, but it's not just for the believer. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this, because I believe every person faces this battle, whether you believe in Christ or not, because of the way God made you. Check out what Genesis 1, chapter 27 says. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. You see, if you're here this morning and you don't believe in, in, in Christ as your personal savior, you don't have the spirit of God living in you. So how does this battle apply to you? Well, the interesting thing is God created you in his own image. And the image of God has implications on every human being because we're all made in his image. The implications is that that image of God gives you what our culture would call a conscience today. 
All of us have a conscience. You see, we can sit and watch the news and watch a man or a a woman murder somebody. and, And in our hearts, we can say there's something wrong there. It's our conscience leading us to say, hey, there's a difference between right and wrong. And we all have it based off the image of God. And so we all face this battle between the spirit of God or our conscience battling against our sinful nature. In fact, this is what a theologian says about your conscience. His name is Dr. Andy. He says, as a general standard, follow your conscience. Yes, your conscience can be distorted as well as more in line with scripture. But in general, your conscience is the morality of the image of God in you. And so there's this battle going on. There's this divide in all of our hearts to follow God's spirit or to follow this this sinful nature. And Paul in Romans, he actually gives us like a practical look of what this looks like in our lives. He gives us feet to this battle. He says this in Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do. Now, I think everybody can relate to that statement because there's just times in your life you're like, what the heck was I thinking? Like, why do I do the things that I do? Like, every single person can relate to that. But he goes a step farther. He says, what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Paul, I mean, remember who Paul is. Paul is like the pinnacle of following Jesus. He's an apostle. He's the guy who wrote majority of the New Testament that we read on a regular basis. He, he's, the, he's like the, the, the leader of faith. I mean, he's the guy who said, hey, follow me as I follow Jesus. This is Paul we're talking about. And Paul comes out and he just says, hey, understand the struggle is real because here I am, one of the guys that you look up to, and here I am saying, man, the things that I want to do, that I aspire to do, that I long to, like I want to serve God, I'm longing to do what is right, but why do I find myself over and over again doing the very thing that I actually don't want to do? And maybe you can't relate to that, but I certainly can. Because there's areas in my life that I'm like, God, I want you to refine in me. I want you to change the way I I treat my wife sometimes. I want you to change the way I I parent my kids. I want you to change some of the relationships and the way I think, God. And I want you to do that, and I have great aspirations. I'm like, okay, God, we're going to do this. Here we go. Six months, a year into it, and I find myself just going back to the same old habits. I'm doing the things that I hate to do, but I'm longing to do the things that I want to do. And I, I, I think everybody can relate to that. And let me just put some more pract- practice to you. Like, let me just give it to you a little more practical. Some of you today, you're struggling with an addiction. Some of you are struggling with an addiction. You don't even know you have it. For some of you, it's drugs and alcohol. But for some of you, it's pornography. For some of you, it's social media. For some of you, it's television. And you have this desire. You're like, God, I want you to work in this addiction in my life. You're like, God, change me. And he does for six months. He works in you. And for a year, and you're like, I got it. But then all of a sudden, you run back to that habit that you wished you and you thought you broke. That's exactly what Paul is talking about. And the reason why we go back to those bad habits is that war that is waging within us between the flesh, the sinful nature, and the spirit of God. And what's depressing about this this battle that wages in war inside of us is it can lead us to depressing places. I mean, maybe you've been there before. I certainly have where I'm just kind of like, God, am I ever going to change? Like, God, am I ever going to get it right? Am I just a a failure that you look at and like, here he goes again. I know you want to do this, Drew, but like, come on, now's the time. But yet I find myself falling into the same habits. And it can lead to a pretty depressing place in life. As a Christian, it can make you doubt whether God lives inside of you or not. It can lead you to a lot of doubt in your faith. Like, wow, why can't I get this right? And we've been there before. We felt those tensions. But what's interesting is Paul says the struggle is real, but here's the truth. You can win this battle. You can win the battle between your sinful nature and the spirit of God. And here's how. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, he says, For you have been called to live in freedom. My brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use, instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you were always biting and devouring one another, watch out. 
Beware of destroying one another. And I, I think this is like a theme verse for this entire series as we walk through some tense conversations. Here Paul says you can win the battle. You want to know why? Because Jesus has called you to be free. We, we said earlier, hey, the gospel is the most unifying force. You want to know why? Because what Jesus accomplished for you gave you freedom over your sin. He rescued you and he reconciled you. And so therefore, because you live in freedom, you're no longer a slave to your sinful nature, but God gave you freedom. And guess what he calls you to do? He doesn't call you to live in that freedom so you can, you can please yourself. No, he calls you to live in that freedom to help and love others. You see, that's what we're called to, to live in freedom so that we fight the battles and the division that our culture faces. So we serve one another and we serve those who are in need and in, in need of dignity and in love. But yet this is what he says. He says, beware. Beware because watch out because maybe you'll take that freedom and you'll end up destroying one another. And I, I think that's ultimately where our, our culture has gone is instead of bringing the divide back together, we've just chosen to use God's freedom to actually separate us farther apart. This is the freedom that he's talking about. He says this in Romans 6. He says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. So Paul says you can win the battle because Christ called you to live in freedom. And that freedom should lead you to fight other battles and to, to, to bring unify, unify our world and our culture. And so here's how he says to win the battle. Galatians 5, he says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. And so Paul begins to build this foundation of how we win the battle, the, the root issue of all divisions. And he starts by saying, you have to understand the cravings of your sinful nature. He says, feeding your sinful nature won't satisfy it. And here's how most Christians live today is we love to, to, to live in this place where we say, okay, God, I'll give you 75% of me and I'll just feed that sinful nature about 25% because we justify it. We're, we say, oh, man, there's cravings there. And so we believe if I just give it a little, it won't want more. If I just appease my sinful nature and I just give it a little bit of what it desires, then it won't beg me for more. And we fail to realize that feeding your sinful nature will never satisfy it. It will never satisfy. When you step into your sinful nature, it just craves more and more. You will never be able to satisfy it. I don't know about you, but um, I I'm a pyro. Anybody else? You know, just like to play with fire. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I love it too. And so I'm the guy who's always kind of seeing what I can blow up or how much gasoline I can throw on the fire. And my wife is usually in the background kind of screaming. And, you know, what's interesting is the way we look at our sinful nature, it's, it's almost like we're trying to put a, a fire out with gasoline. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but that liquid will never work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And, and that's how we treat our sinful nature is we just basically say, if I feed it a little bit, I'll end up satisfying it, and that just never works. And Paul says you have to learn to let the Holy Spirit guide your life. He says, submit to the Spirit, defeat the sinful nature. Submit to the Spirit of God, and you will defeat the, the sinful nature, that, that the cravings and desires of your sinful nature. Let the Spirit drown out your sinful nature. But then what Paul does next is really interesting. I love what he does next, because he kind of shows us which path we choose, based on which path we choose, what it will lead. If you choose to follow your sinful nature, Paul says, here, let me show you what you'll, where you'll end up. And he says, if you choose to follow the spirit of God, let me show you where you'll end up. Look what he says, verse 19, it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealous, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living in that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul shows you your future. He says, if you choose to, to follow your desires and your passions and the sinful nature, here's what will lead. And there's two major words in that list that, that I think really tie to this series. There's a lot of them, but two major ones, dissension and division. When we choose to follow our sinful nature, guess what the byproduct of that is? Racism, sexism, 
We wonder why our community today treats people differently based on how they look or how much money they have or whether they're male or female. Well, Paul shows us why. He says, because you're following your sinful nature. You're following, you're losing the battle here. And, and what's, what's mind-blowing to me, even in my own following a pursuit of God, is if, is if we're really real, and I don't know, scary thing to do is to be real in the church, right? Why would we be honest in church, right? But when we read that list, I think if we're completely honest, we would say, wow, some of those things actually sound kind of good. I really do. I think when we read that list, man, wow, lustful pleasures, that sounds pretty good. Wild parties, I mean, if we're just going to be, you know, completely honest, that's how we feel sometimes. But the scary thing that Paul says is towards the end of that. He says, you, ha you have to understand that someone living in that lifestyle will never inherit the kingdom of God. And here's what he says. The flesh or the sinful nature produces destruction now and forever. And I, I think in the midst of all of those things, the lustful pleasures, those things that look good to us, that are, are, that are appealing to us, we, we fail to realize in the midst of the pleasure of those things, we fail to realize where they lead. We fail to realize the, 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 the repercussions of those choices. And Paul says, hey, not only are you going to destroy your life now and your relationships now, but you'll do it for eternity because you'll be separated from God forever. But then he says, hey, let me show you the other way. Let me show you what it looks like to submit to the Spirit. He says this in, in Galatians chapter 5. He continues. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And isn't that what everybody's looking for? I mean, really, isn't that what everybody's in pursuit of? Like, I, 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 maybe it, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. Who would in their right mind say, I don't want more love in my life? Peace, self-control. These are all things that we're chasing after. I just don't think we know how to get there. And Paul says, hey, when you follow the spirit of God, it produces these, these things in your life. And guess what these things do? They unify us. They don't divide us. They bring us together. When you have love for someone who's different than you, when you have patience and you listen to people who have different perspectives than you, you know what that does is it unifies us. It doesn't divide us because the spirit produces life. The Spirit produces life. It's a better way. Paul says there is a completely different way that we can step into and that we can follow. And it's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I came to give life and give it to you abundantly. The question is, is are we stepping into that life? And so how do we win this battle? The, the, the truth is, is there, the first battle that we have to win, the first division that we need to face head on is not the ones in our community, not the ones in our country. It's the one right here in my heart and in your heart. And until we win this battle, we will never solve any battles out there. And so how do we win it? It's not an easy battle to win, but how do we win it? And Paul walks us through it. He gives us three steps, practical steps that you and I can take today, when we leave here today, to win this battle. He starts in verse 24. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and has crucified them there. So first step to win the battle of the divide in your heart is to crucify the flesh. To crucify the sinful nature. And I actually know crucify is kind of a churchy word, but I love the imagery that it produces, that Paul uses. And I believe he did it strategically. Because he's speaking to a, a culture that, man, a crucifixion was a, a pretty regular practice based off of Roman rule. So all these people would have probably seen what a crucifixion looks like. It was bloody. It was messy. It was a, a, it was a way that you could kill somebody in a, mo, in a painful way. It was torture. And that's what Paul is saying about our sin. He's saying we have to crucify it. We have to kill it. And let me give you two practical ways. Because I know you hear like, okay, i got to crucify my flesh. That's awesome. I'm going to leave here today and I'm going to crucify my flesh. What the heck does that mean? So let me give you two practical steps to crucify your flesh. The first thing that we all have to do is we have to locate those areas in our life, those patterns in our life that we are submitting to our sinful nature. 
And what's funny is I probably, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what sin you struggle with, what things that are, are battling and waging war on the side, but I, I, I bet you probably most of you already know the answer to that. You don't have to think really hard to understand the areas where you're being disobedient to God because the Holy Spirit will convict you of those. You know they're there, so you have to locate them. Where are the areas in my life where I am stepping into my sinful nature, where it's winning the battle? So you find them, and then you destroy them. You, you kill them. That's what Paul, that's the imagery Paul is giving you. See, most Christians, we, 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 we take sin kind of lightheartedly. You know, like, hey, we flirt with sin, not that big of a deal, but Paul takes it to a whole nother level. He's like, you can't flirt with sin. You can't let it linger. You got to take it and you got to put it on the cross because that's where it belongs. That's where Jesus paid for it. And you got to crucify it there. You got to torture it there. You don't mess with sin because if you mess with sin, it will mess with you. And the reality is, here's, here's what I've learned about sin. Sin will torture you or you will torture it. Sin will either torture your relationships and take what you hold dearly to, or you will say, uh-uh, no longer. I will locate it, and I will put it on the cross of Jesus Christ because there he paid for it, and I'm no longer a slave to it. And I will crucify it there, and I will no longer take sin lightheartedly, but I will step in and say, I'm going to torture my sin until it leaves me. Amen. That's the imagery Paul was saying to Christians. we got to crucify the flesh. But then he continues, step two. Verse 25, he says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And so we start by crucifying our flesh, but then secondly, we walk with the Spirit of God. We walk with God's Spirit. You see, the amazing part is God gave us a gift. When we said yes to Jesus, he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit. And man, I'm just afraid today in, in, in churches, we devalue the Holy Spirit and how amazing of a gift that is. And so what does it mean to walk with God's spirit? I know sometimes that can be mystical and weird, like walk with the spirit of God. I want to give you one practical step that I think every Christian needs to learn to do more of. It's, it's, it's a word that we have forgotten in our culture. It's the word listen. To listen. And I just think to walk with God's spirit is you allowing your heart and your body and your mind and your soul to be postured to listen to the Holy Spirit, to his movings in your life. How does the Holy Spirit move in your life? Well, he does it in multiple ways. He moves through the reading of God's word. He'll illuminate a passage and say, man, wow, that came alive. He'll, he'll speak through his people. He'll, he'll, he'll nudge you when someone you're having a conversation in your community group or with another believer that will move you to action. And sometimes he just works in little nudgings. Like you should talk to that person. You should pray for that person. And, and here, here's the problem for many of us is we can't hear the Spirit's voice. Do you wanna know why? because we've turned the volume up on our sinful nature. You see, when you turn the volume up on your sinful nature and you step in to your desires and your passions, what happens is, is you turn the volume down on the spirit. And some of you are like, I haven't heard from the spirit in a while. Well, maybe you should look at the choices you're making. Because maybe you've turned the volume of God's spirit's voice in your life and you've cranked up your, your passions and your desires. This is what James says. He says, everyone should be quick to listen. And he's talking about in every relationship that you have. I think some of the part of the divide that we face in our culture and our community and our relationships is because we never shut up and listen to somebody else. We never stop talking because we know all the answers and someone's like, hey, I'm dealing with this and would you help me? Would you just listen to me? And if we need to listen to other people, how much more do we need to listen to the Spirit of God living inside of us? And here's my prayer. This is where it might get a little tense. Here's my prayer is that as we walk out of here today and we ask God's Spirit to move in our hearts and, and we listen to the Spirit, my prayer is that God would begin to convict us, the Spirit would begin to convict us of ways that maybe we've been thinking about certain topics that aren't helpful to the solution. My prayer is that the Spirit would, would, would convict us about things that we have said, maybe in not wrongful intentions, but things that are actually causing the divide to grow even greater. Because many of us, we think, oh, I'm not a racist, I'm not a sexist. And 
Maybe we aren't. But maybe we just haven't seen or allowed the Holy Spirit to convict us of ways we actually are. Ways we don't even recognize, ways we can't even see that we're actually a part of the problem. And I know that's not fun to recognize. Guess what? It happened to me. As you walk through this, God opens your eyes to things that you say and you're like, man, maybe I am part of the problem. And the only way that happened is I postured my heart to be like, God, refine me, mold me, move me, and break me for what is breaking your heart and the division that is here. This is what Tim Keller says. He says this about sin in your life. He says, the sin that is most destructive in your life right now is the one that you are most defensive about. And maybe today we we need to stop being defended about being called whatever it is. And we start saying, God, is it true? Is it true in my life? Is it real? Do I need to wake up and see it, God? Will your spirit show me that? Because we have to learn to walk with God's spirit. And then thirdly, Paul says, crucify the flesh. He says, walk with the spirit. And then in verse 26, he says, let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. He says, hey, simply stay humble. Stay humble. I believe humility is the missing link in all of this conversation. I have never seen humility ever look bad on anybody. And we see it displayed in in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We, We see the thing that set Jesus apart from any other human being was that he was the King of kings and he was God. He was worthy of power and status and all those things that we chase after. And he willingly gave them up to hold on to humility. And I'm telling you, if, if we're going to see God fix some of the fractures in our community and the divide in our community, it is going to take us having humility. Because humility says, let me listen to you and let me understand where you've been and what you've walked through and the pain that you have experienced. But Paul says, hey, when we choose not to be humble and we walk into pride or conceit, guess what it does? It provokes one another. And that is where our culture is right now. That is what has caused every division that we're going to talk about is this enemy called pride where we walk into the conversation and we know all the answers and we only listen to defute and to to say hell let me tell you how you're wrong you see that's how we listen today is we listen enough to just figure out how we can poke a hole in somebody's argument because we're full of pride and maybe we step into humility and we actually begin to see the hurt and the pain and the suffering that people have walked in and lived in. And we say, you know what? I don't care if I'm right or wrong. I want to mend the brokenness that is here. So we crucify our sin. We walk with God's spirit and we turn our hearts to listen to it. And then we live in humility. And man, I'm telling you what, church, if we do those three things, God will do what he wants to do in this church. God will mend the fractures. God will solve and he will unify us together. And so as we wind down our service this morning, here's what I'd ask you to do. We're gonna sing a song. The bands are gonna come up at all of our campuses and they're gonna lead us in a song. And it's a song that I actually want us to to engage in and sing with. Because it's, it's a song about the Holy Spirit moving in our life. And when you think about the Holy Spirit, it can get really complex and really detailed. But the, the amazing thing about the Spirit is anytime a believer comes into the room, the Spirit is present because He lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit is present at all of our campuses and in your home. If you're a believer today, He's present with us because He lives inside of us. And so as we begin to jump into some really difficult conversations, my prayer and my hope is that your prayer would be, God, allow the Holy Spirit to move in me. May I win this battle where I don't submit to my sinful nature, but I step into the Spirit. And I pray as we sing this song and you engage in this song that it wouldn't be just words on a screen that you sing or you read. 
but it would be a prayer of your lips, that it would be a posture of your heart. Holy Spirit, move in me. So at all of our campuses, would you please stand with me? And would we be unified together as one church all over the Rochester area saying, may the Holy Spirit move in this church so that we make a difference and unify our community. Let's sing together.